Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the last uh, <laughs> session of the workshop. I know we lost quite a few of our audience as we soldiered on. Uh, so this session is on political parties and leadership in India. Unfortunately, one of the panelists, Shima Chisti, has not been able to be here. And we been able to put together a uh, Skype connection here, which Yusuf will operate up the work. Uh, so Sima will be the first presenter, she will probably be speaking only for 15 20 minutes. So Ajay and Jeeves, uh, you have a little bit of extra time for so much. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so, so all the extra time is coming uh, So Yusuf, can we connect? Hopefully this will work. We might not have the visual because the connection is not very good. It's through my phone. And the title of the paper is 2017 MP Election Campaign Hi. Development and the Ocean. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, Shima, can you hear us? Hi, Roger. Yeah, so you can start your presentation. You are, you are all here. Shall I go? Yeah. Sure. Very beginning. I can't hear you, Rajan. Oh. Okay, okay, I'll just begin. Uh, hello, friends. I'm, I'm really sorry for being barely audible and sort of out of the frame as well, but it's still uh, useful if I can share some of my thoughts with you on UP, the campaign, and what happened and what uh, some basic assessments are. Uh, I'll do it as, um, as, as quickly as I can, so <laughs> you're strained less hearing me on the phone. Uh, but uh, essentially, had Akhilesh Yadav won this election, it would actually have been historic. Uh, nobody else has really returned to power, except of course Jidi Pant did, in, you know, in the in the first elections, with, uh, which he won, won before independence and won after it. But other than that, UP has, contrary to what is portrayed about UP as being this placid uh, acceptor, a, a, a zone of no change, has displayed a tremendous appetite for change and an overwhelming desire to kind of empower whoever they wanted to fix things rather fully. So you see that in the way Mayavati gets more than 200 seats and then suddenly it's the Samajwadi party which gets way beyond what it was expecting, more seats than Mayavati five years later and of course you have the BJP getting about 325 seats. So in a sense, uh, if, you, if, if one wants to look at it, it seems as if it conforms with that trend of a UP uh, looking for change, looking for something different and it has brought the BJP in. But clearly there is a something more afoot, it's more than just business as usual and that that's clear if, if for all those who travel to UP or studied it closely. Um, UP uh, gave a BJP an overwhelming number of seats as is evident from the 2014 numbers and uh, you, India wouldn't have been the BJP's but for UP's overwhelming kind of mandate and 73 seats that the NDA got and uh, that's what makes the situation an extraordinary one with a Pakka majority government at the centre and one in Lucknow. So, and I think that is actually at the heart of even uh, wanting to examine the question of how UP is going to inform how India is going to be run for the remaining two years tenure or what the messages are that the BJP is planning, is, is giving to India via, you know, what's happening in UP. So, essentially, uh, the BJP's a comfortable head start of its 46% vote share never really went anywhere from 2014. And in the way the BJP played it quite smartly and deftly, helped it along. It did not go in for a chief ministerial candidate, which would have allowed the local BJP to come into focus, other than the caste kind of equation entering. So it kept it and played it like a vote. It almost you know, did its best to make it about uh, as about 2014 as it could, the vote was clearly for Modi and that paid off. It, you know, more than just dog whistling, it made it very clear what its agenda was and it kind of pushed on the Hindutva agenda very clearly, watching its posters, its slogans, whether it is the anti-Romeo uh, campaign. It was almost a near borderline Hindu Yuva Vahini campaign as it was run throughout and it was done with a lot of sophistication and a lot of determination and planning. The fact that the BSP openly went out and spoke of a Dalit Muslim alliance helped 
BJP talk about this even more and uh, there were people annoyed in the way that uh, the maybe even the SP and the Congress got together who uh, well, you know, it was easy for the BJP to uh, differentiate its brand, uh, as it were, and come out openly and say that, you know, we, we are as much about exclusion as we are <coughs> about inclusion. So I think that kind of non jatav non-Muslim, non-Yadav, and also to a large extent, a non jat campaign worked very well. So it's not as if the BJP does not give Muslim, uh, Muslims tickets. If, for example, in the Delhi election, which has 272 wards, it's given five Muslims the ticket, but it was important to exclude Muslims from 403 cities to make it very clear what the BJP was talking about in this campaign here. So, uh, so I think the BJP did not, I mean, it would like to present itself as a sort of a caste-free election. So it's not caste-free, it, but it very smartly did its own mosaic. It kind of teamed up or grouped these little caste groups differently. So through a very interesting um, idea of detail, it got together its small jatis, its small castes aligned with the upper castes which completely stayed with them. And of course, as Jeel's very, uh, very good analysis, very robust uh, assessment of the UP assembly tells us that about 44% of this present assembly being upper caste, but propelled there with also the support of uh, the, the you know very very small cast that were very with a lot of hard work with a lot of uh, uh, attention kind of got together by the, the BJP's political campaign. So you actually are looking at a scenario which is a Hindutva plus small caste, but the exclusion of almost 40 40 plus percentage of the population. So I think that's the essential challenge that the BJP faces now as we come out of uh, you know as we now look at it. Uh, because how much are, are, they, are, are they going to be able to give the people that they have promised, the small caste that they've got, got together uh, with this kind of upper caste, um, you know, if you like, dominance or a, or a clear kind of a head start that they have in the assembly, how much are they be going to be able to offer them a share in power? And so, you know, that I think is their, their essential challenge. So for me, what is important about this UP result and looking at it nationally is whatever may be the reasons for why people voted the BJP and that they retain their 40 plus percent share, you know, there's just a very small diminution, but huge uh, seats, see, the number of seats they've got are tremendous, is the interpretation that the BJP high command or the BJP leadership has given this. So by putting in somebody who's a very clear symbol of, of a certain kind of politics, the uh, you know the Hindu Yuvan Vahini chief or Adityanath as a CM. So for me, that that has the more interesting implications. That whatever may be the reasons why people have voted, the interpretation of the results is as a very clear kind of a signal to get away a from the caste uh, criteria because while Adityanath may be a, a Thakur etc. a dominant member of the of a, of a dominant caste in UP, which is done very well now, it kind of gets away from what caste he is because his his first his primary identity is very clearly something else. And number two, it takes away from perhaps other niggles or other issues that say a Manoj Sinha or uh, another, an alternative uh, BJP CM would have posed by uh, keeping another issue constantly on, on the slow boil. So for me, that has implications on how the BJP proposes to, to also run India because it is the heartland, it is India's biggest state. And uh, one must say that uh, uh, Mr. Modi or anybody didn't really need to actually press on the so-called Hindutva issue after 2014. There was no doubt or reference to the big revolution, etc. But you see a refashioning of even its Hindutva plus development campaign in this election by making it clearly one of Hindutva itself as the development message. So the, there is no offer of more roads or more schemes or more laptops. It's just that, do you know who these things are going to now? This time, they will reach you. So I think those, are, you know, for me, that remains uh, as central to what, uh, how this is an important moment in the NDA government at the center, uh, seen through the UP prison. So, Ronjoy, that's my basic uh, premise and my assessment after seeing the campaign. Thanks. Hi, Ramachandran. Thanks. Yeah. So we, we heard you. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
yeah, we'll be in touch and we will, and I'll just mail you my notes and we'll take it from there. Okay. Thank you for your patience, uh, friends. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Changing sociological profile of the SP and PSP in Uttar Pradesh.
depicting the three social categories associated with the BSP and DSP, Jatav, Mokayadav, and Muslims, as indeed obviously a stretch of the imagination. Uh, but the argument is that there is a case to be made about the elitism of both the BSP and the SP when one looks or analyzes the uh, social composition of their elected representatives. So more particularly, I'm looking at the transformation of the sociology of regional parties over the past 10, 15 years uh, or so. Uh, so this will be a bit sketchy and I will present I will concentrate my presentation on, around a few empirical observations that I draw from uh, a data set that I have built on UP state assembly legislators and candidates. So this data set combines individual candidates' performance, ECI data, election commission of India data, uh, data on a composite profile of candidates to assembly elections, which includes uh, gender, caste, religion, education, and occupation. It covers MLAs back to independence, and it covers candidates back to uh, 2007. And the data also contains the mapping of individual trajectory of any individual who contested an election in UP. How many times candidates have contested, and which party affiliation, in which uh, constituencies and with what uh, performance. So the classic way to conduct the sociology of parties in UP is uh, to look at the caste composition of the assembly over time. This is a work that has been done in the past, uh, notably in the rise of plebeians, the volume which was co-edited by uh, Sanjay Kumar and Christophe Jaffero. So to make a long story short, the victories of the BSP in 2007 and of the SP in 2012 depended largely on electoral strategies that combine an inclusive discourse based on development and social justice, or on the promise of delivery of development and social justice, with an inclusive caste strategy. Inclusive in the sense that regional parties started having distributing tickets across caste groups for quite a while, with the result of becoming more diverse in terms of caste composition, as you can see in uh, this uh, table. So, uh, not to go too much into detail, you see that the BSP here, you can see that the share of OBCs among its MLAs has always been very important. And you see that the, the, the share of upper caste MLAs has actually been rising with a peak, of course, in 2007 when a lot of Brahmin candidates were uh, inducted or given or rather sold tickets. And uh, for the Samajwadi party, which started strongly as an OBC party, you see that share of OBCs is actually diminished over time. And if you look at the Samajwadi party in 2012, you see that the four main groups are, have a roughly equivalent uh, representation uh, within, uh, within, the, uh, within the party. Obviously, you have a great deal of differentiation. These are very large. These are group categories which do not correspond to actual costs. And uh, so you will have more yadas among the SP, more, more non yadas among the OBCs, but roughly you have a social composition of two regional parties which actually is more diverse than uh, what it used to be. So there is a story of heterogeneization of the political class in UP, which is well known, and which was furthered by the fact that regional parties became themselves more diverse, notably by integrating more upper caste candidates uh, within. Therefore, so the BSPs and the SPs, quote unquote, inclusive terms stem from their realization that strategies that focused exclusively on their core electoral basis would prevent them from broadening their support base and therefore would prevent them from winning elections. And the instability of the UP politics in the 90s came in part from the fact that parties spoke mostly to their respective core support base through hopes of reservation, religion, class preferentialism. As a result, you have a lot of verdicts or a kind of chronic intergovernment uh, instability. Uh, but this inclusive turn, as it's often presented, uh, and which has led some to speak of, of a post-identity politics, needs to be qualified. Because in the context of UP, it has meant essentially two things. One, it reflects that the fact that party strategies have become more localized. Parties distribute tickets after evaluating which local social alliances would be most likely to yield uh, seats. So parties will look at local demographics, they will look at local political context. They will determine you know, what would be the best possible local alliances distribute tickets accordingly. So this is the phase of class arithmetic, the transferability of uh, board bases. Second, the inclusive term means, meant that regional parties opened their door. 
it goes to greater upper caste representation, not for the sake of providing representation to upper caste, but out of the observation that upper caste tend to remain a dominant uh, political force, social presence in many localities, in many constituencies, and therefore needed to be co-opted wherever they occupy a position of, uh, of, of dominance. And this partly explains why upper caste have remained predominant among the MLAs in several sub-regions like um, Havana and the Northeast. So we often think about UP uh, uh, narrative as a story of decline of upper caste, uh, rise of OECs. Uh, this is the thesis of Christophe uh, Jaffrelo in, in, in the Silent Revolution. But what you see is that you have entire sub-regions, and large sub-regions like Havana, for example, or the Northeast, where upper caste domination in terms of presence or representation rather in the assembly has never really been uh, challenged. And in this period, it's largely explained by the fact that they were opted also more and more into within the uh, regional uh, parties. Now, there's one problem, probably more than one, but there's one problem with this analysis is that it focuses only on one variable caste and expanded at the expense of other dimensions of the social profile of MLAs. After all, once parties have identified which class they should apply locally, they still need other criteria than class to, to pick their, their candidates. And that's where um, consideration of vulnerability interview, whether the candidates or aspiring candidates possess the attributes that are reputed necessary to win elections locally. You need some class following. You need to be able, able to mobilize within and preferably beyond your own cast. You need individual resources. Uh, you need your own patronage network. You, have, you need to have some mobilization capacity. You need to have a personal reputation. You need oratory skills. So there's a number of uh, attributes that constitute winability. And we often, too often, reduce it to uh, money and muscle and caste, you actually have uh, much more uh, to it than that. So my work on UPMLA has shown that this multiplicity of selection criteria of candidates has a strong filtering effect on who gets the chance to run on a strong ticket. And at the same time, the dividends of being an elected representative also acts as a filter for certain profile. In short, the rules of the game privilege those who have the resources to build autonomous political support in order to draw the attention of parties and get <coughs> tickets to run. And in the context of UP, and this might be true for other states as well, this means that more and more candidates come from a business background. More and more people who are engaged into business activities uh, contest uh, election. And in this regard, class is only one factor among, uh, among others. So what is crucial, of course, is the kind of resources that candidates you know, can mobilize. And that tends to be determined by the position they occupy in the local political economy. So I'm not only talking about whatever amount of cash that they can get, <coughs> what sort of network they can rely on, uh, what kind of support base can they mobilize. And when we think about patronage, we tend to imagine a relation between poor client and, and rich patrons, but it's also a patronage network among people who control economic assets in, in a given um, constituency. So the problem that I faced uh, looking at this is that we don't really have data to support uh, that view. Of course, affidavits will tell you what is the uh, self-declared occupation of uh, the candidates and the MLAs. But what is a farmer, what is a businessman, obviously it's very, very vague and not very helpful. So I've spent quite a few years uh, doing field work in, in UP to basically verify and collect data on the economic profile of uh, MLAs and, and, and candidates. And the result that I have is that starting from 2002, you have a considerable increase of the number of MLAs who uh, declared some sort of business as, uh, as, uh, as occupation. And you have a similar decline of people who uh, declared uh, agriculture as occupation. Uh, I would be cautious with uh, this uh, particular chart uh, because for the previous years I would suspect that you would have a lot of businessmen disguised as farmers or people who would declare farmer as an occupation but would have obviously other source of income. But there's no denying that in the 2000 you have a sharp increase on the number of people who uh, 
know, declare business as uh, a background. And that's really a departure from the past, when most MLAs either declare themselves to be farmers or members of some liberal profession, more of the, very often lawyers. Uh, through the 50s and 60s, farmers accounted for slightly below 40% of the assembly. It's a ratio that increased to over 50% in the 80s at the height of Kisan politics. But since then, as you can see here, the numbers have really uh, have dropped by half, uh, standing at 28% in, in 2012. Um, so according to the assembly's rules, lawyers were traditionally the second most representative profession. They used to make an average of 18% of the MLA's until the 90s. But now they make less than 3% uh, of the families who declare law as uh, a profession. And then really the category that has increased a lot are um, the uh, business people. And uh, if you only take those who can be classified as business, you see that uh, the proportion actually varies from one party to another. I, in business, I also club basically those who have you know, construction, builders, uh, those who declare industry, uh, I exclude trade. So you see that you have interesting variations uh, per uh, party. The party that has the highest number of businessmen among its rank is actually the BSP with 66%, uh, followed by uh, the BJP, the SP, and the uh, Congress. Uh, trailing uh, a little bit behind. This may seem counterintuitive with the image that we have about the BSP, but in reality it makes actually a lot of sense because the BSP knows that it cannot get direct candidates elected in general seats. So they tend to distribute tickets to local strongmen who uh, acquire very often the tickets in order to expand or further some form of uh, some form of um, private um, interest and uh, the reason why uh, these proportions tend to be higher also with regional parties is because the BSP and the SP tend to call members of local elites as their candidates contrary to the BJP and the Congress for whom the candidates tend to come more from the organization and of course the reality is uh, more complicated than that. There are other variations but I can't go into too much detail I'm happy to share those slides with those uh, interested uh, but among cast group, you see that uh, businessmen are actually well represented across cast group. Even among them, I mean, thirty-six percent are engaged in some form of uh, business uh, activity. Uh, in terms of sub-region, also you have, of course, variations. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, sub-regions that have seen more economic transformation, like uh, the West. Uh, Doha uh, have high, uh, pro higher proportion of businessmen politicians. The East has actually a lower ratio. Uh, Bundelkhand has a very high ratio, but Bundelkhand has a small number of MLAs and they are practically all engaged in, uh, in, in real estate. And so the rise of businessmen in politics makes sense if you one considers the ever rising cost of entry into politics. For most parties, candidates are expected to defray the cost of the campaign, contribute to party funding, they must spend money years in advance in order to build the kind of party network that are necessary to garner popular support. So uh, the centrality of money in electoral politics also pushes a lot of politicians to develop business activities once they are elected. So between 2007 and 2012, among the 95 re-elected MLAs, 41 had shifted from non-business related profession agriculture, teaching, medical doctor, to a business-related occupation. Uh, 36 MLAs declared themselves as agriculturists in 2007, declared themselves as businessmen five years, uh, five years later. Uh, and in short, I mean, nearly half of the incumbent MLAs shift to some business activity after their first election. And generating money is basically seen as, necessary, as a necessary condition for re-election. So what is interesting is that most of these businessmen politicians uh, come from specific sector of economic activity, come from construction, real estate, transport companies, breaking ownership, vehicle distribution uh, and, and production and so forth. And that's not coincidental because these sectors are strongly dependent on the state through public contract, the licensing system. Uh, these sectors of economic activity are um, also uh, very prosperous, they are cash rich, 
can generate a lot of black money, which can be used to uh, fuel uh, an, independent, an individual uh, campaign. And these sectors of economy, uh, of economic activity, are also among the most criminalized sectors in, in Europe. So the mix of that, closeness to the states, cash rich, and criminalization, offers many incentives and opportunities for, for, for individuals who belong to those uh, milieus to expand joint politics to expand their business activities. Uh, they get protection from the state, uh, they get protection from the competition, they get access to social status. I mean, there are many reasons why uh, businessmen would join uh, politics. And the fact is that regional parties, because also of their uh, electoral strategies, have actually opened their ways, they, 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 their gates quite wide to uh, these individuals. Because these parties had a core electoral base, which they had mobilized for many years but which in itself was insufficient to win elections. So they needed to basically make local alliances with strong candidates who could bring the 15 plus percent of votes necessary to uh, win uh, seats. So everybody had incentives to give a lot of tickets to um, uh, business people. So, uh, so while the political class has become more diverse in terms of uh, in terms of past, it has also become more homogeneous in terms of economic background. And that, I think, is a factor which is also important to understand uh, voters' reaction in 2007. Uh, the success of regional parties in recent years has been based not just on their ability to include many castes uh, in their fold, but also, and more importantly, on their ability to attract candidates who were drawn from locally dominant uh, groups. And who these elites are literally varies from one constituency to another. So those strategies are very, very um, localized phenomenon. Um, there is an important difference, however, between the SP and the, and the BSP. For the BSP, the candidates are selected largely outside the organization. It, uh, the catchy sentence I have for that is, BSP externalizes the business of winning seats to local entrepreneurs who invest in politics to further some form of private interest. For the SP, it's a mix of both. They, they select outsiders, but they select more people from within the organization. But that's because there's a strong adequation between local elites or a segment of the local elites and the Samajwadi Party organization. And over the years, the Samajwadi Party, more than any other party, has come to incarnate and embody you know, the party of the new elites of uh, the state, which could become the focus also of anger or resentment of a large number of segments of the voters who uh, were not, uh, who were excluded from that kind of uh, uh, configuration. But the point is that both parties tend to recruit their candidates from uh, the same uh, sociological pool. So that contributes to explain why the BJP discourse consisting in portraying these two parties as the two sides of the same coin found echo among many voters. The BJP succeeded to bank on an anti elite resentment which was addressed at the local representatives of the SP and the BSP. At the same time, it also banked on the resentment of the traditional elites, essentially the upper caste, who seemed to have voted massively for the BJP in 2007, and who in a way still feel very often that they have been deprived of um, the place that um, should be there in politics because of the ascendancy of uh, so-called quote-unquote uh, backward parties. So of course this is not the only reason that explains the effectiveness of the BJP strategy, but I think this is one um, contributive uh, element. There are other reasons why the strategies that worked for regional parties in 2007 and 2012 failed in 2017. Uh, actually, I have a long list here, but I'll make it shorter. And uh, the main reason, uh, I think, is that uh, the kind of social coalitions that the BSP and the... Uh, well, not. The, uh, the main reason why uh, the SP and the BSP... Um, uh, kind of, sorry, the kind of social coalitions that the SP and BSP uh, attempted to build were minimal winning social coalitions. So you have your own core support base, and 15%, 20% of the population, of the voting population you're given. Then you need the minimal amount of vote necessary to win a seat. And, uh, and it makes sense because even strong businessmen belonging to local communities or uh, local elites will still be in competition with others. 
So their own mobilization capacity is essentially quite narrow as well. But as long as the rest of the space, floating voters, non-aligned voters, and they have different names, uh, remain fragmented, these uh, minimal social winning coalition strategy actually work. But if all these non-aligned voters start voting for the same party, uh, obviously those um, strategies, the very same strategies that made that enable the SP and the BSP to get their majorities become uh, become um, ineffective. And on the campaign trail, we heard a lot of people saying that we like Akilea, she sees the the vote to development, but we really don't like the local SP only because they capture basically all the benefits, or because they are wounds, or because they exclude most people. Uh, in 2012, many BSP Jataf cadres complained that the party had sold tickets to people who did nothing to upgrade the condition of Dalits after being elected with their support in 2007. So what you have is a growing disjuncture between parties, candidates, MLAs and voters, which challenges our understanding of how representation actually works. And uh, in conclusion, uh, through strategies of inclusion, regional parties have reinforced their elitist character by coating members of locally dominant groups as candidates and therefore as MLAs. Uh, the incentives that draw these candidates into politics, the rule of the game, the sociology, often brings them to uh, basically encourage them structurally to all sorts of predatory behavior, which is just a fancy way of to talk about corruption and, 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 and criminality. And this ultimately has generated a lot of resentment that whatever good intentions party leaders had was basically thwarted by, uh, by their own local representatives. So the BJP victory was driven by a strong elite rejection sentiment, but not just any elite, but those associated specifically with the SP and uh, the BSP. And that leads me to conclude that there's an undeniable plebeian aspect to the BJP victory, to reduce it as an outcome of communal as an outcome of communal consolidation will be misleading. I'm not denying that communal consolidation, that Hindu consolidation took place, uh, but that's not all there is um, to it. Uh, but the premium character of uh, the BJP victory is very real because of the composition of the social base uh, of the party and because of the anti discourse that was assumed by uh, the BJP. And, um, This anti-new elite resentment has been fueled by the kind of predatory politics exercised by the local incarnations of regional uh, parties. Now, two questions to, to end. Will things change now with the BJP victory? I don't think so, because I haven't been able to collect data on the new MLAs, uh, because the data that exists at bit is problematic. But a brush stroke uh, examination of the BJP is mainly revealed that they are no less elitist in many ways than uh, in the previous assembly. They are largely overcast. Uh, the non yana OBCs count a lot of Kumis who, as Joy has argued, cannot really be considered as uh, subaltern or uh, dominated or non-dominant uh, OBCs. Uh, they have sense land, they, act, they also act in all sorts of businesses. Uh, they are, many of them are quite uh, well off. Uh, and I would expect a lot of local new elected politicians to actually, to actually engage into uh, business activities because it's also how you sustain yourself uh, in, in, in the long run. So this puts into question the emancipatory, emancipatory potential of backward politics and challenges the claims that class inclusiveness means actually inclusiveness uh, at all. So these elections present some sort of a paradoxical result. There is an element of anti-elite revolt uh, from uh, non yana non-dominant OBC that have been excluded by the backward politics of the regional parties. But there's also an element of revolt of the old elites, of the traditional elites, against the new elites. Uh, the outcome opened the way to a resurgence of upper class representation, and how this is going to play out in the coming months uh, and years is going to be a question uh, worth uh, following. Revolt maybe is a strong word uh, to use, but there's no doubt that there has been a lot of resentment against uh, the individuals and the categories uh, they belong to that I've seen have been really benefited from association with the parties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we now come to the final presentation, not only of the day, but also of the
workshop, uh, uh, Rise and Fall of Mind by Ajay Mos. Uh, we heard Ajay earlier today in the afternoon, uh, but I'll just briefly introduce him. Uh, Ajay is currently the resident political commentator on CNN News 18. He began his journalistic career, as he mentioned, in the early 70s, and he has worked in various positions in the media, including the executive editor of Pioneer. Uh, he has also written three books, uh, For Reasons of State, Delhi and Emergency, The Shah Commission, and his latest book is Behenji, A Political Biography of Mayavati, which I believe he is revising. Well, um, I am, as you heard, I am a biographer of Mayavati. I wrote the book shortly after it came to power in 2007. The book was in the making for a few years before. Penguin uh, approached me for a book, how many for a book for a while. But they came out with the biography series. I chose Mayavati essentially because of three reasons. I mean, the, she was, you know, there was a personal saga of Mayavati. It's an incredible uh, story of Mayavati. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the BSP as a party was an absolutely unique party didn't uh, resemble any other uh, political creature, uh, you know, in that entire spectrum, uh, whether the Congress, uh, the Socialists, the Communists, uh, the Jan Sounds, and it wasn't really a regional party in the sense. So uh, it fascinated me, the whole structure of the party, very unique. And finally, of course, it dealt with Dalits, who are the most uniquely oppressed community in the world, so they were denied the gods. Great. So, um, so yeah, I found it fascinating, but I, I sort of had my, because I knew that something was about to happen um, to my ability. Uh, I, I think it was around 2004, 2005, which was down in the dumps. Um, but um, I thought of speaking to her, although I, I, I knew Kanshiram rather well, because uh, I was one of the few, uh, first, first journalist to be friended because of Shinoi, uh, my friend, uh, uh, Martin Rumi, and he was very close to Shinoi and I used to have chats with him, long chats and arguments with him. Um, he was very, very social. I loved him and to talk to him and argue with him. And um, so, but I didn't know my wife really, very well. Uh, I thought of speaking to her, but uh, a, a good and a very close aide of her, she found she could warn me, that don't go and actually approach her. You could get into trouble. And, name uh, really insist on what goes with him. And uh, I didn't know at that point that actually he had a bad experience with Sharad Pradhan, a very, very veteran journalist who was took with him, and was going to write a biography of my and she had agreed to meet in the official biography. But uh, when he, Sharad being a good journalist, he wrote what he thought and that, that the whole biography collapsed. And so I was very glad that I didn't uh, talk to her. He didn't know that I was writing the book. Uh, and then when uh, it finally came out, and I got quite friendly with Satish Mishra and the translation thing, and I talked to a lot of people who were close to her, people who hated her as well. And anyway, when it came out, uh, there were mixed reactions from her. Uh, because it was a broadly sympathetic, empathetic book. But um, I mean, when uh, it was first published in English, she was fine. When we published it in uh, Hindi, in Lucknow, and launched it in Hindi, I went and had tea with her. I mean, I knew her, of course, it's not that I had met her, but I had, you know, toured with her in lectures. But, so she was very nice, but next day, I found that Sami Prasad Maurya, who now went to BJP, and who was a main hatchet fan in Uttar Pradesh, had greatly lambasted me and said that he gandhi gandhi baat likha And I think she was referring to a few passages of my was his relationship with Kanchiram, and also of course a full chapter about uh, her rights to which story and about charging of corruption and stuff. So, but I thought they would burn the book, but it didn't happen, and ultimately I was in a very happy position of a journalist, um, um, you know, uh, who, who is considered broadly sort of sympathetic, but certainly not very liked. Uh, and then later on television shows, I became the BSP spokesman because BSP never really sent anyone. So they boycotted television. And I often had to defend the BSP because at that point there was this total tirade against when she was in power. And it increased in 2009 when she tried to topple 
the Manmohan Singh government. So uh, I've had very strange relationships. But now, you know, I am basically the first edition was just after she came to power. I wrote the second edition when uh, she lost power in 2012. And now I'm just about to bring the curtains down. Uh, I'm actually changing the subtitle of my book from Benji to The Rise and Fall of My uh, you know, and so, uh, my swan song, Benji, as it were. And, uh, uh, you know, a little similar to what Trotsky, uh, you know, what you know, Deutscher did to Trotsky, the prophet armed, prophet unarmed, and prophet outcast. Anyway, I feel that the rise and fall of my exercise is both the opportunities and limitations for subaltern groups to achieve political power in India's largest state and political heartland of the population. Twenty-two years ago, a young Dalit woman became the ruler of the as head of a minority government in a movement to turn of Indian politics. Ironically, she did so with the help of high caste Brahmin leaders of two national parties, BJP and the Congress. The then Prime Minister, Narasimha Rao, also a Brahmin, celebrated it as a miracle of democracy. Since then, Mayapati has had many successes and failures. There may be several factors that would have contributed. Looking back at a turbulent political career, I do believe the single most important force that has guided our trajectory has been the support or lack of it from key Brahmin political lobbies that were largely responsible for propping up the Dalit leader in the first place and also for a decline after getting increasingly disenchanted. Indeed, it is a telling paradox. The leader of a party of the lowest caste, with a overtly anti brahminical ideology, was catapulted to power with the help of leaders and lobbies belonging to the highest caste, and has rapidly faded over the past seven years once that battle was begun. Before I go on, let me qualify <coughs> what I mean by Brahmin support of my ability. I am not at all suggesting that a Brahmin voters in Uttar Pradesh at any point consolidated behind the line. We know that the percentage of Brahmins voting for her never exceeded a maximum of 20 percent or 50 percent. And that many more members of the community have been voting in successive elections over the past several decades, especially for the BJP, but earlier on also for the Congress. But there is little doubt Benji film that had made Mayavati at one point of time the most promising star in Indian politics was rooted in a specific political context. And when that started shifting, the decline began because she could not adapt to the changes. And that is where the importance of Mayavati's Brahmin film comes in. Let us recall the political scenario in which Mayavati This was in the aftermath of a historic electoral alliance between two proponents of the social justice plan, the Samajwadi Party and the BSP. The two had succeeded in forming a coalition government after beating back the mighty BJP German bloc, despite the Hindu religious frenzy that had preceded the polls during the demolition of the Babri Mansur. But the Allies soon turned against each other provoked by atrocities by Yadav landowners, the vote bank of the Samajwadi Party, and Dalit peasants who sought protection from the BSP. The ambitious Samajwadi Party leader, Milan Singh, and Chief Minister, also had plans to get a majority on his own by breaking the BSP and engineering defections from the BJP and the Congress. It was at this time that worried BJP stalwarts like Atul Gari Vajpayee and Nuri Manoj Joshi, in consultation, with the then Prime Minister Narasimha Rao came up with a counter to check the lines in the other of the strikes. They thought could daily coup to topple the Mulayans in the other regime by luring away his ally BSP with the offer of the Chief Minister's post. It was BSP founder Panshiram and mentor of Mayavati who jumped at the deal despite being on his sick bed and ordered the surprise protege to proceed to the town to take over. 
that was the point when Mayavati and the BSP go into a completely different political zone altogether. Now, it is no small irony that the powerful Brahmin lobby in the BJP and a Brahmin Prime Minister like Narasimha Rao pushed for a Dalit party whose core ideology was anti Brahmin and whose leaders had been openly abusive to Brahmins for their stranglehold on Hindu society in the past system, the stigma that he for centuries and centuries on the Dalits. Interestingly, other sections of the BJP, like Yod Rajput leader, a former chief minister of Kalyan Singh, and a Thakur leader like Rajnam Singh, were far more skeptical to the idea of propping up a party that had been so openly hostile. Yet, leaders like Vajpayee insisted, and Prime Minister Rao, a close friend of his, laid along despite murmurings in the Congress that this would help the BSP make further inroads into the party's current base. But the Brahmin leaders were convinced that a wily leader like Mulayam Singh representing the rising middle class and buttressed by Muslim support posed a far bigger threat than a fledgling party that lay right at the bottom of the social media. They were supremely confident that once the rise of Mulayam Singh and his party was checked, the Dalit party could either be managed or discarded altogether. It is too credit to my in that she swiftly managed to turn this condescending attitude of the Brahmin lobby to her advantage. She kept turning the tables, using them for nearly a decade to increase her own stature and the reach of her party. It was a remarkable achievement for a Dalit leader with not much political experience and a party with little credit in <coughs> political establishment who have outmaneuvered veteran Brahmin leaders of the day. Although a minority government formed with BJP and Congress fought collapsed within a few months, the BJP would once again prop up in 1997 and even after that ended in bitter acrimony would yet once more provide the support a few years later to snatch back the throne in Lucknow. Every time the powerful Brahmin lobby of the BJP facilitated Mayavati's climb to power With each successive state goal, the BSP kept on gaining the number of assembly seats won and percentage of votes garnered, even as the BJP dipped further and further, the Congress getting increasingly irrelevant. The importance of the upper caste parties like BJP and Congress bind with each other to facilitate the rise of Mayavati and the BSP as a political force in the community was huge and should not be underestimated. Till the early 1990s, Kanshiram Dalit was seen as mainly an interesting new political spectrum of subaltern aspirations with limited relevance to mass electoral politics. Certainly, nobody had expected the Dalit party to be the leader to capture power in the country's government. Even after the BSP shared power in the Mulayan government and Mayavati went around posting as a super, as a super chief minister, most political observers were convinced that this was just temporary political drama. And it was a matter of time before the widely Samajwadi party leader would swallow up the BSP or in the process the coalition government <coughs> would collapse, leading to fresh elections and the gainer could only be the BJP. The fact that the Mayavati managed to emerge a clear winner each time in the rough and tumble of politics, keeping ahead of the game with the Brahmin lobby, creating an aura around them. The rising stature of Mayavati did not create a flutter just in, just in political and media circles. It made a huge impact on civil society. When the leader and party of a social group right at the bottom of the past land was given such inordinate importance in the political hierarchy by upper class leaders, it created electric bus across caste and that brought the BSP support from various sectors of India. And when that leader and party flourishes, not by outlawing to upper caste interests or values, but pursuing a defined in your face agenda, the impact is even greater. Firstly, it helps Mark to shore up the support of all others reaching beyond the core jungle things. But even more importantly, impressed in the BSP Supremo growing stature a whole slew of backward class, particularly those known as lower backward class and those in social economic conditions in Berlin, 
became an integral part of the world. It was a win-win situation for man. Each stint as chief minister with BJP support brought her more votes from Nanja and Dalits in Bangalore. Even as this emerging new face provided her increasing political muscle to negotiate a better deal with the Brahmin lobby. Just before the 2007 assembly polls, exactly a decade ago, <coughs> Mayavati played her master's role. She entirely bypassed the BJP Brahmin lobby and struck a deal directly with the Brahmin community. With the help of her close aide and lawyer, Satish Mishra, belonging to a respected Brahmin family in the state, she turned the party's traditional anti brahminical stance on its head. She got Mishra to organize a series of Brahmin Aichara Sammelan, the Brahmin Brotherhood meetings across the state, where an openly alliance between Dalits and Brahmins was discussed. Mayavati also announced a record high number of Brahmin candidates, nearly a fourth of the total, and more than double of the political strength. The new strategy not so much because it led to a large-scale Brahmin consolidation behind the BSP, because bulk of Brahmins continued to stay with the BJP even in the 2007 assembly. But the bulk that had already started about Mayavati across various social groups in the state grew to a loud chorus because there was an impression before the poll that the Brahmins had abandoned the BJP and were sponsoring her as a new leader of the I remember conversations while on the election campaign trade before the 2000 polls as at, you know, at tea shops across the city. Brahmins usually dominate this conversation and invariably remark that this time you know, Benji would look to be the show as others at the tea shop not at This led to a historic 2007 poll victory that catapulted the Dalit leader as a premier political star. The fact that she was able to win a majority with the many had earlier felt impossible. And the incredible achievement of a Dalit woman emerging triumphant in the country's political heartland against all of us opened speculation of a tectonic shift in, in the politics, and much like what we see today actually, we talk tectonic shifts. But you know, I remember those days, I mean suddenly Mayavati, you know, the end was possible. Mayavati's social engineering project that brought such spectacular success seem to open possibilities of an inversion of the social pyramid, with Dalits instead of Brahmins leading a broad-based social alliance, capturing power, and unleashing radical social reform, benefiting millions of economically deprived and socially oppressed people. At a time when India was at the crossroads, with people disenchanted with both the national parties, the BJP and the Congress, the BSP Supreme War appeared to point of fresh election. Indeed, Having conquered with the Pradesh on her own, Mayavati was poised to soar into a new political order. Unfortunately for Benji, it all started going downhill in the few years of her coming to power. Entangled in a tug of war between her political sponsors and her co voter base, it did not take long for her horror to start staying. Unable to handle the daunting task of accommodating Brahmin interests in the Dalit party, Mayavati began losing support from four communities, each resenting that she was favored to the other. Within her bureaucracy, an ugly struggle broke out between a new Brahmin age and old Shibu class for the Hajj Brahmin. A Dalit party functionary, the workers deeply resented at what they felt was the dilution of the Dalit. The Jatos felt that the Brahmins had hijacked the party. Other Dalits complained that the Jatos had gone and most of the benefits. Many backward class felt that they were not treated with the same favor as Dalits. Of course, the Brahmins and upper class view, the BSP's Dalit agenda had no place for Compounding Mayavati's war was the Prime Minister of the She had started dreaming of the throne in New Delhi the moment she assumed office in the town of 2007. She had even boasted about this in an interview. The opportunity came a year after her historic victory in the UP assembly polls. The Dr. Manmohan Singh led UP regime was pushed to a corner after the left front reduced support in the India US UK team. Reduced to a minority, the Congress led coalition turned to Malayam Singh in desperation and in a surprise move, he responded positively. Mayavati rushed into the fray, partly with an eye on Malayan Muslim base that was poor and is supporting the deal with the hated Americans. But more importantly, for the 
first time, they offered an opportunity for the PSP to play a key national role. And she was convinced that if she succeeded to topple the UK regime as the spearhead of a united opposition, we would make a front runner for the coming 2009 national polls. Ultimately, it all turned out to be a terrible misdemeanor. But to be fair, not because of violence playing a part wrong, it was the BJP's own wavering leadership of the NDA that resulted in cracks in his ranks and Dr. Manmohan Singh won a famous victory in the nuclear deal war with the Lok Sabha. This gave a big fillip to the Congress led coalition government just ahead of the 2009 parliament report when it swept for comfortable victory. It also crushed Maya Bhutti's hopes of pushing her case in a badly fractured political scenario. Having lost her momentum in the race for the number one job in the country, Mayavati soon found that she was struggling to maintain a position in Uttar Pradesh as well. In a fit of megalomania, she had ordered the construction of giant statues of herself as part of the iconography, encompassing a pantheon of dead leaders of the past, revered for long by the Dalit movement. But this slightly bizarre and unprecedented spectacle of stone replicas of a living politician clutching a handbag, mushrooming all over the Pradesh, became a handy tool against her for critics. A series of scams involving a key ministers and bureaucrats also seriously tended this measure, giving credence to long standing charges of personal corruption. A spirited campaign by the Congress led by Rahul Gandhi led the charge against the beleaguered Dalit leader. Rahul Gandhi's mischievous <coughs> trick using the BSP's elephant symbol to berate the Mayavati regime for corruption in high places, describing the Mayavati as an elephant that eats currency rules, appealed to the public. The real beneficiary was Akhilesh Yadav, the young scion of the Yadav clan, who won many hearts by cycling around Uttar Pradesh and swept to a convincing victory in the 2012 December polls. Mayavati had been convincingly vanquished, and a party produced to just eight seats in the 403 member state assembly. Had the political scenario of Uttar Pradesh remained the same in the weak BJP, the relevant Congress, leaving the political space in the state to two regional giants. Mayavati party and the BSP, the story of Mayavati may well have turned out quite different. It is very possible that with the Samajwadi party failing to live up to expectations, it would not have taken for the BSP and the Supreme Court that long to win back support both from the Brahmins and other sections of the day. After all, despite the house lift from power in 2012, the votes done by the BSP in the Senate group indicated that it was still a formidable force. But the advent of Narendra Yamadalas Modi on the national stage shortly after Mayavati's loss of power in the 2012 assembly polls in Uttar Pradesh completely disrupted the dynamic of the BSP and Mandi's political capitals. Modi's meteoric rise had a direct bearing on the Dalit's <coughs> because it was Uttar Pradesh that was his launch It involved the resurrection of the BJP whose decline in the state in the mid-1990s had most benefit. Till then, the Gujarat chief minister was a distant figure in a faraway state and went little to our politics. In fact, she, along with her mentor, Ranshiram, had even campaigned for him in 2002, despite his alleged role in the anti-Muslim war problems, in return for the BJP making a chief minister of the Pradesh for the third time in the That a politician from Gujarat, aided by his hatchet man Amit Shah, also a Gujarati, would ultimately turn out to be a political nemesis. It's a paradox that Mayavati did not see coming if it was too late. The making of the Modi Jagannath and the reinvention of the BJP is far too long a saga to go in detail. But suffice it to say that the rise of a muscular BJP in the state has removed two vital props of the Mayavati's political sponsorship from Brahmin lobbies within and outside the BJP, and the ready availability of a fair segment of the factory class. There is no question that Mayavati has lost all traction with the Brahmin's and has a similar disconnect with the factory class. The defection of key BSP leaders considered really close to Mayavati as Rajesh Parag and Sanjay Prasad Mohan There is also little doubt that Mayavati has been the biggest political loser in the series of riots that engulfed the 
In the relentless religious polarization that the Christian state was the past of the world. It resulted in the Hindu war, including many backward castes and a section of non Jatam Dalits who sided with the Bilgeti, even as the panic struck Muslim minority has clung even more to the Samaj of the There are many who believe that both parties have been responsible for fueling this atmosphere of hatred and violence in a fixed match to push the BSP out of their my own own attempt to forge an alliance with the Muslim minority for the 2017 wars as a substitute for a lost deal with the Brahmins that ended unmitigated disaster. Despite giving them a huge number of seats, even more than what she gave the Brahmins in 2007, the Muslims did not shift in any significant manner to the BSP, choosing to stay with the Samajwadi Party Congress alliance. Interestingly, the Brahmins too did not vote for her. BSP in very large numbers in 2007. In my opinion, given them a large number of tickets and projected the alliance with them. It's an interesting comparison. The big difference is that even the talk about the Dalit Brahmin alliance increased my stature, getting awards from across the past. On the other hand, the alliance with the Muslims had exactly the opposite effect, diminishing the BSP's prospects and damaging the party's image as an anti Hindu party, openly pandering to the Muslims. BSP Supremo ended up as a double unit, not getting the kind of vote she expected from the minority, even as large sections of the majority rejected. The collapse of the Dalit Muslim Alliance, sought to be fought by Mayavati in the 2017 assembly polls, underlines the difficulties of the subaltern groups helping each other on their own, at least in the day. It is significant that Muslims voted the way they did in the polls. Despite the palpable inability for the inclination of the Samajwadi Party to protect Muslims in the face of the violence, and the relatively good record of Mayavati in protecting the minorities when Chief Minister, even when she ruled with BJP, it shows that the Southern group has little faith in a group similarly handicapped in the social and economic cloud to be able to protect its own. Without support, higher up in the social hierarchy, such subaltern collaborations find it difficult, if not impossible, to succeed in elections. It is also true that such collaborations or attempts to forge such collaborations are seen with hostility and suspicion by other social groups, making their chances of success even bigger. Finally, let me turn to the future of Mayavati and the kind of legacy that she has left. In India, it would be unwise to put full stop to any leader's career or deem the decline of a party as terminal with no chance of survival. It is in the realm of possibility that Mayavati can get together with Akhilesh Yadav and even Jain Singh of the Russia to take a united stand against the BJP in the coming 2019 elections as a part of a broader nationwide alliance with opposition. Stop Prime Minister Modi from at least making a clear move. Technically, this may even succeed. But honestly, I do not see Mayavati or the BSP being able to flourish in a political context that will dramatically change. And in a country where the old triggers of identity politics are no longer. It would be also surprising if Mayavati itself, despite the favorable ability past to bounce back from adversity, we will be able to survive two electoral levels, one after the other, in 2014 and 2017. The first, wiping a party out entirely from the benches of the Lok Sabha, the second, reducing BSP to less than 20. So, Mayavati now faces the mortification of losing our own deficits after the term expired next year because the meager number of BSP not enough to send party. As for the legacy left behind by Vajji, there is little doubt that over the past few decades, the politics of Dalit empowerment has taken a huge hit because of the kind of success that Mayavati and the BSP achieved No electoral route can take away the incredible rush of political happiness that Mayavati Saga has pumped to the of the Dalit movement. Not just in the 
it is too early to predict the future trajectory of myriad and big right through the mushrooming of health across the country and the growth of new young health conditions. We also do not know the larger implications of the rise of depressive and other formations that the beam army and the cultural revolution embodying the consciousness in the shame of beam jargon songs and things shared across the world. There is a tremendous buzz that is happening in the community, not just in the community, but in the rest of the country. And I think it would be very, very wrong to ignore these new things that are coming up among the which go beyond it happening almost in parallel level. They are seen as counters to the aggressive propaganda of the RSS mission. There is also the worrying loss of faith in many suburbs of the groups, the politics of the battle, because of continuing controversy about breaking the economic voting machine. We also do not know how the alarming spread of Hindu fundamentalism, which is not spoke earlier, and the growing disquiet among the Muslim minority being helpless and almost Most importantly, we have to wait and see whether the elevation of the new month will be affected. The UP chief minister is just a clever state of hand by the Modi Shah or is it the beginning of the end of the day that we have moved into? Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. We are doing very well for time. Nice, very short presentation. I think we have a good set of ideas that has come forth in the three presentations. Sima talked about how 2017 was in some ways a repetition of uh, 2014. There's also making an interesting idea, all those things, uh, in my flesh, that Hindu Kwa and development were two separate entities, but uh, she spoke about Hindu Kwa as development. Jesus, I think, gave us some very interesting numbers on the heterogenization of political parties, as he called it, and how there is still a considerable degree of upper caste dominance, despite all this talk about OBCs, etc. And he gave us figures for Abad and Northeast in particular. And also, the interesting fact that there are more and more candidates in all parties, in particular in the BSP, uh, in both contestants as well as winners. Uh, having a background in business, particularly in the construction sector and more other criminalized sectors. Uh, we also floated the interesting idea of SP, Samajwadi Party, as a party of the new elites. And finally, we talked about the premium aspect of the victory. But also, raised the question whether this anti elite role has an emancipatory. Enjoy uh, the chronicle of the rise and fall of violence uh, and the importance of the Brahmin lobby in both the rise as well as the uh, remarkable victory in 2007 and how they all quickly unraveled uh, on various things, including the satisfaction with the court base as well as the remarkable fact that she built statues to herself. And looking at the future, I think uh, you know, that uh, Ajoy has raised the prospect that a lot of people have, I think, been thinking about whether you know, Mayavati to survive will strike an alliance with Raj for uh, Samadhi party, as well as smaller parties that are in But that's still a big question of all the things that might technically be difficult for someone like that. So with that, we believe um, I I have two questions, one for you and one for you as well. It has a very interesting presentation, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but, you know, looking at your uh, you know, not the conclusion which you presented. There is something deep which is coming out from the data which you showed. Uh, that is that there is a long debate on the nature of state in India. And this is a different state which is coming out now. 
this is a state which says that it, the prime task of the state is to mediate between competing interests and therefore the professionalism which we talked about in the first half of the day is something which is very clearly visible uh, by the profession of these uh, new, by, the, by the profession called business. Uh, it reminds me when I was doing a survey in uh, late, nine, late 999 uh, that was uh, a survey of MLAs and when I asked the question, what is your profession? Uh, one MLA laughed, said politics kept him. Now that is now changed. Now you have got some respectability to the profession called politics and business and professionalism is coming out. So that's one thing. So the state is a different state now. Uh, we are in the second phase of liberalization. A state which says that the prime task of the state is to mediate competing interest. And therefore, the question of inability, which is now in, 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 the, in, in the first half, I also raised the question of ideology, became more important and significant. I would like to you to respond to, to, to the question of ideas and ideologies in relation to the changing composition which you uh, mapped in your presentation. Uh, Ajay Bhai, uh, very interesting the way you presented and narrated the story of Mayavati. Two quick things. Uh, one you touched upon, and that is that Mayavati is the, uh, the first statement she made after 2014 was about the vote percentage. She was the only politician in India who is very keen to use voting percentage as a political statement. I would love you to respond to that. Why? That's one. Second is that when, and you made a very interesting observation about, about the unity of some entrepreneurs. Uh, and you also indicated, but I would love to hear more from you, that if you make a distinction between various forms of politics, so electoral politics is one, just one form, and look at different social movements in the country. For them, electoral, the limitation of electoral politics is very significant. And therefore, when the question of alliance comes, of subaltern group, they would prefer to go to that direction, not the direction which Mayavati, uh, Dalit Muslim unity, things like, are, are, are proposed. So I would love to hear you on that. Thank you. Excellent. For Mr. Ajay Bosch, um, thank you very much for an exciting presentation and also for uh, the um, biography genre. I mean, that's something we don't have. And usually, um, people end up writing hagiographies, and all they don't get access to sources. And that, that's the I, I work on uh, European politics also, so I see the difference. So well done for that. Couple of questions for you. Um, there are two things about Mayavati I uh, don't quite understand. I mean, first, she never identified in her persona people she spoke about or for. I mean, there's a kind of Conspicuous consumption starts with Kansiram. Kansiram would always go in an air conditioned car. I mean, she will not go out. He will not go out. People will come to him. And Mayavati follows in their genre. I can't uh, attest to it, but I'm told she's looked younger as uh, she got more and more into power. I mean, so much for beauty parlors. And then there are these uh, elephants and uh, other marble statues. So, why this hiatus between her persona? and the people she was uh, talking about, people she was drawing on. I mean, what is the grammar of politics of power that's uh, involved in this kind of inversion of imagery? Uh, in the same vein, she never really made much of gender as uh, an issue or as a source of power. That she shares with uh, others like uh, Mount Avanichi or Jayalalitha, maybe also Mr. Thatcher. So these women politicians don't really form gender as a political capital. Now, why is that? Jim, uh, just one small thing, not really a question. Why is it that it is the proportion in which the percentage of candidates having business interests increases exactly in proportion in which the uh, number of candidates having agriculture as their interest drops. So, 
I was curious, maybe we can talk about it later, but is it because simply of change in coding or is it at that juncture really that uh, agriculturists drop and business persons uh, enter into or storm into politics? So that's one and the other thing about what you said was uh, in 2012 you pointed out that BSP had a large number of persons having uh, business as their occupation. So one would be interested perhaps in knowing their caste composition as well. But as I said, there are two small things. Uh, then on uh, Mayavati, uh, you know, you made certain observations at the close of your presentation. Uh, one was about, or a couple of them about Dalit Muslim unity. Uh, earlier, long ago, one of the faction leaders of the RPI from Maharashtra had actually broached this issue of Dalit Muslim unity, Jogendra Kavadi. And therefore, in a sense, the idea was already there. That's one small thing. The other small thing is, However, in Maharashtra itself, the experience in the Mumbai riots of 1993 shows that there were a number of RPI corporators, including one woman RPI corporator, uh, implicated in attacks against Muslims. So I guess there is this some kind of a tension. On the one hand, there is this externally imposed uh, idea of unity of subalterns between Dalits and Muslims, whereas on the other hand, at least sections of the Dalits probably share the overall Hindu imagination of Muslims as the other. So there is this possibility. But more seriously I thought and that is something I was waiting for is why the imagination that you said Mayavati fires over the last couple of decades etc. and that is granted the fact remains that Dalit politics whether of Mayavati or anywhere else but particularly of Mayavati who had a national ambition still remains confined only to one caste not even across the different castes among the Dalits. And that I guess is one of the important issues to be captured in the Mayavati story that in spite of all her pretensions about social justice on the one hand and Dalit unity and Ambedkar and Kanchiram as the icons or symbols on the other hand, the leadership remains dependent. Even in 2017, 90% of the Jatos have voted for uh, BSP and as against that only something like 13 or 14 percent non jato Dalits have voted for BSP. So, of non jato yeah. yeah, I mean, there can always be differences on this. We can check on that. I'm, so, the larger issue still remains, whether it, I am, the figures are right or wrong, the larger issue still remains. And that is this imprisonment within one's caste. Thank you very much, Hira. Thank you, Uri. Great, great question. Um, well, the nature of the state has basically a mediator between competing interests. I mean, that, that also comes in tune with the job description of elected representative, which is also to mediate between segments of electorate, segments of voters, and whatever resources they can have access to, and in the case of UP, mostly uh, state uh, state resources, and, and that works basically from Tessel to um, right now. Uh, I, I do believe that most of the, uh, what we like to see a bit normatively as a dysfunctionalities of uh, electoral politics uh, in, in UP criminalization, uh, the, uh, the, the parasitic presence of parties and MPs and MAs uh, on, 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 on public institution has to do a lot with the weakness of state capacity and the fact also that the rules of the game uh, create a condition for, for, for predation by political actors at a high level by parties, but at a local level by individual uh, MPs and um, MLAs as well. Uh, there's a question of representation, which I'm, I'm seeing, I mean, I, I don't have very clear, uh, you know, theoretical ideas, you know, what the implications in the area of representation, but for a long time I thought that representation was really the key or, or, or the aim, and then we spoke today, you know, in several instances that uh, a lot of people who haven't been represented and actually want representation. 
But I think there's far more at stake than uh, the, the symbolic uh, benefit of being represented, or even the material advantage you can derive from that. And um, I take a lot of inspiration from the work of uh, Jeffrey Witzow in, uh, in Bihar, when he speak, basically, makes, basically says that you know, the finality of politics is not so much representation, but it's territorial control. And from the part of you know, dominant groups. What you really aim to do is to expand further, develop, or challenge uh, the uh, domination that is exerted by specific, uh, uh, by specific group you know, uh, locally. And, and that domination is not just political, it's also social and economic. I mean, the figwork I've done in, in, in Western Europe, uh, Satendra and I did uh, a little work um, together, uh, shows that you know, every village tends to be dominated by one or two groups or different warring factions within one dominant group, as the case of the jazz very often. And, and and those groups tend to have disproportionate control over local economic assets. Uh, the bricking, the transport companies, uh, I mean every activity which is key for the development of art. So every economic asset which creates dependency vis-a-vis -vis other local segments of the um, Population and those who have control of those assets can derive political capital uh, from that, and that's what they do. And uh, but that that sort of becomes really the heart of the system, and and, and, and and it feeds from the state. And and and, and parties act in complete collusion with that because this is basically how they recruit their personnel, and it's how they recruit their leaders in their uh, in their candidate. Um, I don't know that I'm not the most qualified person to speak about the role of ideologies and I, I mean, I'm, I'm an empirical guy, so I'm a researcher and uh, I, I, I tend to, you know, look at practices and and, um, and more, more pro pro probably as, uh, as the role of um, ideas. Only thing I can say, maybe it's just repeat myself, but um, this state of affairs creates you know, a lot of resentment, create also a lot of exclusion. So maybe you can define the role of the state as being mediation and the role of uh, elected representative as mediator, but can mediation be fair? Can, can it be exercised in a fair manner? Uh, given the competitive nature of politics in UP, I, I, I really uh, doubt, uh, I really doubt. Uh, so, um, To us, yes, it might probably be uh, a question of coding, I, I think, but more than that, uh, I think it reflects also the um, transformation of the rural economy that Satendra was talking about uh, earlier. The fact that uh, more and more people actually divert their activities, run away from agriculture whenever they can, and or uh, invest in more productive forms of uh, economic activity. Uh, in the Western UP, uh, you've seen a certain number of economic sectors that have actually boomed uh, and that are linking over the urban, the urban development. So uh, it's not exactly a surprise that the new political class should emerge from you know, booming sectors of the uh, economy, especially, especially since, again, the rule of the game creates also a lot of incentives for uh, these people to invest into politics to get into um, politics. And they do have um, competitive assets and competitive arguments against more traditional uh, political figures who uh, would still be based in, in, in agriculture. Uh, but we know that this farmer category is actually fairly meaningless. You, should need, you would need to cross that with size of land holding. We don't have precise data that so it's a small farmer it's a big land no we don't really know and uh, so i would be very cautious with the data that i just shown like it's really indicative but uh, what i get from from the field from the field work I and mean, pushes me strongly you know, into that um, into that uh, direction and uh, i would have a couple of things to say about uh, statues and conspicuous consumption but i really want to uh, uh, okay, great. Uh, I'm going to answer Professor Mitra first. Uh, um, uh, it's interesting that 
a waiter always dressed in a suit and a gown. And Gandhi uh, chose to work with their anointing. And uh, I think Jem Thiel was that uh, America didn't need really to show him uh, with the people he needed to dress it in the And whereas Gandhi needed to produce credentials, he had to start a suit to wear a loincloth. Um, I do believe that um, I've asked this question to so many of uh, so many Dalits, very poor Dalits, you know, when she comes in a day, uh, sort of hardly visible. And she's so much at a distance. And uh, also conspicuous consumption. Uh, I think nearly 99 of them didn't have any problems. Uh, doing that. I mean, it's, it's one of those very strange things that at the height of her power, she was, I think, the most sort of inaccessible. Uh, and she used to wear the most, her birthdays were celebrated in the most conspicuous manner. It's only in recent years, actually, when she's been on the decline, that she's been slightly sober, that she wears sober colors. And her birthdays are usually you know, less conspicuous. Um, and as far as her own Constituency, a narrow constituency, particularly the Jatin Dalits, uh, who are, are concerned, I think it never was an issue. I think what really mattered, and I think this is where the old man, and I remember uh, W. Ahmed describing in great detail when they used to uh, you know, take these cycles together to go through you know, various fields, in which she was this young, only gay, Dalit pirate. Uh, and she used to sit in the village jar parties in the court. There was a connect. There was a connect which really she lost over the years. And she became an icon of a leader with the nose close to the ground. And I think uh, this is something which I'm writing in my final chapter that how the danger of doing that is that maybe your flaw, and as you know, about 90% of the time, we don't have to do and very few leaders that you know uh, match that. Or even if they got 90 percent, 50 percent, that's the truth. The fact is that when you reach out to a larger constituency of the poor and oppressed, they are not going to take off. They they want the mass connect. They want somebody to be touch and feel. They want somebody to speak directly. I think that's where she really lost the problem. Which leads us to your first question, which I think is an interesting one about statistics. Or voting percentage. And actually, Bharati made this huge mistake because she is the most wonderful person. Because her vote in UP is spread so evenly up, even with 22%, 23%, she doesn't get that much because it's all evenly spread out. Mulan Singh Yadav, on the other hand, does rather well, even with similar percentage, because his vote is concentrated in particular areas. So, you know, when he gets that kind of vote, it means that in certain areas, he gets well over, you know, 35, uh, you know, sort of percent of vote, whereas she does. But your second question is one which I want to dwell on a bit, probably. Uh, because I think that is something which uh, we tend to ignore when we look at elections. I get a feeling that we have to look beyond electoral particularly for several years. I think we are on the cusp of something which is new and happening. Because this uh, kind of buzz I have not seen in the other communities ever. And I've been following them for now a good few decades. And I haven't seen this angry buzz, this consciousness and social media has made their WhatsApp groups are just buzzing. And it's huge and they are all really frustrated today because they cannot find expression in electoral politics. They are going to do something with this energy. They have to do something with this energy. The BJP doesn't satisfy this. I'm sorry to say uh, that BJP does not satisfy. This is a much more radical kind of mind. And what we've seen with growing their brother, make right groups, and, and they are, some of them are highly educated people. I mean, this is the Dalit creed. We are looking at highly educated Dalits. Something will be done with this. I'm not very sure what we are going to see. I mean, it's very, very interesting to 
see other things. So it may not have a direct impact on the electoral politics. But electoral politics is not the end of it. And when we add to this the kind of scare or disquiet among the Muslim we are looking at new situations. Now we really don't know how this plays out because you know it just happened. I mean, this, this feeling is about to happen. But I think uh, Mayavati this time really managed to get the Dalit support. Well, I think 2014 she realized she had really uh, kind of slowed down. And this time she revived the concept. Bhimami was supporting a, a whole range of Dalit groups who do not necessarily agree with Mayavati's rather cynical politics of really, you know, you know, getting somebody a criminal, some strong man, and getting them and attacking the other. I think a lot of these people are unhappy with this. It's not romantic politics, it's not politics that a lot of them feel. There's a lot, they're looking at a lot of feelings. It's not just a question of elections, because civil society is in turmoil. You should understand that, you know, this is in turmoil. It's a huge amount of churning happening. I mean, you know, if you go to a tea shop, you feel it, it's a sense of you know, electric tension. It's not sort of all easy and going. And a lot of groups feel threatened. And they feel back. I mean, the Bhim Army, I mean, the right of the Bhim Army and Chandra, you know, of man like Chandra Shri, it's just incredible. These guys are huge, massive guys. And why is there Dalits? They're roaming around the West UK. You know, they're speaking, I mean, you couldn't have to imagine doing So, uh, in fact, your thing about Jatra sitting in Brazil, it's quite interesting because you know it's no longer the old <coughs> kind of paradigm that the charters are very oppressed. This is, this is what is the contribution of my uh, you know, this is political empire. So we'll have to see how it all plays out, but you know, it'll be very, very interesting. Can I, can I add one small thing about your statues and rocks? And every political regime with a sense of mission <coughs> wants to outlast its existence by leaving a physical trace of its presence. That's why we have monuments, I mean, as humans in general. And uh, the act of building those parks and those statues, and not just of herself, but a whole pantheon, as you mentioned, um, was in a way a way of corrective measure to uh, the uh, erasement of that is from history uh, you know, in, in, in the past and until we uh, present. So obviously it had to be big. Obviously scale was important. Could not be uh, a, a tiny Ambedkar statue in every village. It had to be something that really strikes the imagination. By the way, the main Ambedkar park in Lucknow is built in Gokinaga, which is a largely Brahmin area. Uh, it's, it's literally, she, she changed the course of a river to dry a swamp which was next to a uh, Brahmin uh, residential, post residential area to build the park right there. Uh, literally, literally <coughs> in there. So the symbolic power, I mean, when you, uh, I was there recently with my students. Yes, so, and, and the water inside that, uh, that place, it, 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 the water, the stream water, is it, called the Bhim Ganga. And, you know, I've seen Dalits actually go there and, you know, just use that thing as Ganga Jal. But this is Bhim Ganga Jal. It's just incredible sight to me watching. Yeah, no, that was, that was that. Seema is not here, but she ended her talk by saying, basically talking about the development agenda of the BGP and UP and saying it's the moral is a footnote, nothing very substantial. Uh, I actually disagree with it for important reasons. Because I think mainly because of BGP's nervousness about uh, the SP's development agenda, what they have done is really they have, uh, you know, come out, they have, the development agenda which they have given is a uh, Basically, a huge, uh, it has a huge budget cost attached to it. So let me, for example, you know, interest waivers, uh, which is already, sorry, credit waivers, which has already happened, zero interest loans, subsidized electricity to farmers, uh, uh, doubling social pensions from 500 to 1000 rupees, 10 world class universities, free laptops, free education to all girls in tertiary education, and so on. So, if you put, actually start putting a budgetary tap to this, these are one, some of the most expensive promises which any state uh, 
in any party has played in a state election. And I think this is very important. This will play a very important role in the months and years, in the couple of years to come. The fact that the manifesto got worded in, a, in an extremely populist fashion, the BGP manifesto. I just want to make a point because that is where she ended. But two other issues. You know, this is your point. I mean, I know you said that the indicators you really this whole question of uh, shift uh, to business. And basically, this whole question of the nature of the elite as indicators, and you qualified your statements. I think where I disagree with is this whole question of elite versus elites. I think there's a, I, I need to fundamentally disagree on this question. Because for two reasons. One is yes, you know, the BSP strategy of choosing their political, you know, the, the political candidates have always been very different. I won't go into it, but it's always been very different. But if you abstract a little bit from this, and, and the second fact, of course, is that once SP decided, when Akhilesh decided to become the party, the compromise was that he had to live with the candidates who had a deal of anti incumbency against them. And he couldn't change them. Now, if you take aside these two factors, the BJP was starting on a clean slate with a very high support base in 40. And if you look at their candidates, and all across the parties, candidates with the criminal background, candidates with the links, links with the mafia, candidates of all kinds. There is no difference across parties. If you look at district-wise profiles, there is absolutely no difference in parties. Yes, the SP candidates would have been greater anti-incumbency. So I think if you view the election outcome as previous versus elites, I'm afraid that will not do. BJP won the elections fair and square for many reasons. It was not because it, the nature of its candidate somehow was, I mean, I, I can go to significant details to show how at the local level, the choice of candidates was no significantly different from the other party. So that is why I am saying this characterization is not a fair characterization of the outcome of these elections. BJP had a chance because they started very differently. They had no anti incumbents They have not pulled the state for many years. That's one point. Secondly, with uh, respect to uh, no, very detailed presentation. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, we should not boil everything down to caste and caste lines, questions of identity. Uh, it's true that BSP, you know, first of all, Mayavati lost the plot in some sense as long as the, the Bahujan Samaj was alive and kicking. And then the organizational entity called the DS4 and other entities working for it, you know, there was a consistent basis to the, the kind of mobilization which occurred. And once the analysis started shifting and so on, I think she began to lose it in some way. But her win in 2007 was not due to this or that alliance. It was due to the completely, you know, the mafiafication of, the, 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 of governance in Uttar Pradesh by the SP. And because Mayavati was seen across the board by many, many sections as somebody who could give effective and uh, <coughs> effective governance and the rule of law. It was mainly the, this whole issue of the rule of law and the fact Mayavati would actually deliver that. There was an anti-SP vote and other words, and a cross-section vote which came to her in the 2007 election. It was a single most factor, irrespective of analysis, irrespective of support support. So I think in any election, we should not, the social identity, mobilization and all that is fine. But there are these cross-section votes, I mean, you know, these kind of votes, and political leaderships and systems of governance, which can actually, you know, uh, galvanize them. Okay, so we go around the uh, room, CS the run out of time. So I, I'd like to respond to that. Okay, I just want to respond to that. I, I must, you know, you must understand. Uh, the DSP, when it was first formed, the DS4, the bomb set, till actually 93 happened, nobody had really expected the DSP, you know, they have to perform, to really become good enough to be a player to get on doing. Uh, you know the party of the Dalits, uh, 
at less pressure group, and maybe you know, I mean, like it has to be taken into account by various other larger political parties. And then once that alliance came with alliance in Africa, but I think the real story changes, and I think that the mistake we made is to look at violence rise and ESP's rise out of some big social mobilization they were doing. Actually, doing that. No doubt, no, not that they were doing that. But it was helped enormously by the fact that she was made chief minister twice. You know, each time you got power. And I think that's where, you know, she trained. The BSP gave stature. And as you know, and as I, I am, you know, I really I feel very strongly that for somebody right there at the bottom to come right at the top, I'm afraid it does not happen in mass electoral politics. They came because of a particular historical juncture in the British politics. So we need to put it in context, you know, the rise and fall. In a particular context, you know, and I think the, all the other factors there are, I'm sure, many other factors which we can look at. But the central factor is just this that the, the whole context change, the whole British politics change. You know, and, and I think that she was a product and her rise was a product of a particular juncture where the Brahmins were completely disarranged and they could fold away to the British politics. But, <coughs> and although, despite the other group, Maybe warning and pleading, and I might know the kind of politics which went in play behind the scenes, and you know both sides going after each other, you know, and even none was shared in the situation. You remember the way he's dead, you know, uh, and both you know, so, the so, 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 Okay, so, so, okay so, I think we have to The so, issue yeah. here is to see the rise of DSP. As purely a brand new no, 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 no. that is a little too much. That okay, maybe we can continue this conversation. Really, and so very short questions. Yeah. So since this, this is the, yes, yes, since the, this is the, 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 the last, uh, the last uh, yeah, session. Okay. The things that you see for for the entire day, day, day today, um, it has always been on caste, religion, Hindu, Muslim, cow. So I mean, um, is this going to be a, a eternal uh, cycle of India? I mean, next fifty years. Are we still going to talk about cow Muslims and, and Hindus? And we still talk about the development in Hindu going um, next to each, each other. I just want to draw this point is that let's look at uh, Germany, uh, Nazi Germany. Even even Hitler was poor, poor development. Germany made huge huge industrial progress at, at that time. So what's and the I, question? Just, yeah. Actually, I want to make, make the comment this. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. we have time for questions. Just a question. Okay. The question is this, is this going to be an uh, eternal cycle? 50 years from now, are we still going to be talking about, talk about cows and cars? Thank you. <laughs> Just a quick comment on your uh, statue uh, thing. In India, we uh, learned Vastre Sastre Sabhajite and Health Dress Address. So that doesn't matter. Leaders are seen as role model. So if I dress well, uh, that will be perceived well. So it doesn't affect negatively. That's my understanding. A question to you, uh, Mr. Bose. Yeah. Uh, you talked about uh, fascinating uh, thing about Mayavati. What I learned about Mayavati, because I'm not, uh, I don't follow very closely, but that C bids seats for constituencies. So if I pay more, I will get seat. Uh, the, the, because of this demonetization, suddenly there was a cash crunch. So she couldn't distribute, and particularly in Dalit communities. You distribute money like thousand rupees per uh, head. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the question. That how that affected okay. the election process. You had a question. So very short questions. A, I loved your presentation and the data therein. Are there any specific areas where you differ from? The, from the work done by the Carnegie Foundation or the Carnegie Endowment, Bill and Vaishnav and, and their data. So, I'm guessing there's a lot in common, but if you guys disagree, that would make me really happy at some point. Um, <laughs> and a question for you, sir. Um, given that UP has rejected both SP and PSP, do you see this as the beginning of the end of identity-based politics? And perhaps other things 
you know, taking over instead, which incidentally would make Anish very happy. Question just very briefly. I want you to address this. Uh, Gene, could we think about when, because I'm writing the biographies of uh, politicians in Western UP, uh, particularly yeah. business and criminal, yeah, so called, quote unquote, I don't know which criminal, but criminal politicians. Yeah, sure. And uh, they were with, it, very, you know, with humble backgrounds, yeah. most of them, 10 years ago. Like somebody was the play, was a laborer in a kind of a band, and somebody was Chinese sailing, very, you know, like a you can you can call what Anil Krishna says that they are all just doubts and a small time Nayaneta sort of things. So this is the category which changed after two three elections. They become a big businessman, and I'm talking about also about Kuresi, Some of the Kuresis who had a very humble background in meat and business also, and clothes and others. So there are several of them. So I don't know. I'm just it's like a suggestion to, to we can talk a little bit more whether how they began in 2000 uh, uh, 2011 BSP and SP came and how it happened over the period of time. I don't know. There's no, there, there, there are many cases. So there are many stories like this. Is Haji Iqbal in Saranpur who started as a seller of utensils and ended up with a 10,000 crore. Uh, empire scattered around 11, 111 ghost companies, uh, shell companies, and uh, well, I know this is recorded, but uh, but uh, so I mean they, 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 there are and, and and politics also gives you the opportunities of becoming businessmen and you know expanding uh, local you know business empire. So uh, of course those are those are those are there. There's no complete determinism, but it's the rule of the game have an impact on who gets in and, and what becomes of people who join politics. On Milan Krishna, Milan, Milan is a good friend and there's actually a lot of similarities between our argument. Um, in fact, I would say that businessmen and businessmen enter into politics for pretty much the same reason that criminals enter politics. Where I differ with him is that he still makes a fairly simplified analysis of, I mean, the, I differ really on the treatment of the data, that he still has this, uh, tendency of uh, basically clubbing the data together and, and using this 30% criminal uh, you know, MPs or MLAs figure as a bit of a sensation. I mean, if you look at the data qualitatively, it's actually uh, more uh, nuanced, uh, more nuanced uh, than that. But it's basically a system of incentives from the point of view of parties, candidates, and also social acceptability uh, from the point of view of voters. It's the three combined that create a ground which favors the emergence of uh, these uh, kind of uh, politicians. And uh, Ravi will talk about this over, over there in a few. Yeah, okay. Uh, there are, I think, two or three questions. Uh, one was, of course, about cash crunch. Um, I think most political parties will be against doing demonetization. And I think that uh, much of this thing about Mayavati selling tickets. I mean, she does, I mean, has a very unique type of cash collection plan. Um, I think it's a little exaggerated because I, I, I think that you know, it's a nice tool to beat her with. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, you know, she actually goes around bidding for this thing. But yes, candidates often uh, do contribute their, you know, their entire campaign. So, yeah. no, no, what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's not a black and white kind of situation where, you know, there's a bidding system, you know, that's like, um, as far as identity politics is concerned, um, you know, um, even after these elections, even during these elections, a lot of identities were used, not necessarily just caste identities, but you know, whether it was a Hindu identity or the Muslim identity, Muslims were cast into one particular type of identity, and Hindus were cast into another identity. And finally, your question about, uh, uh, about how long will this whole cash, you know, cow, and this sort of thing, and how, why can't we have this? modern elections on developmental issues. I think one of the problems about this, and as we've seen in the American elections, is that, uh, you know, often you have, uh, say, look at Trump's campaign, and it was one of the most amazingly controversial campaigns, and he won through that. He sent certain messages. So I think often people talk in very, very controversial forms, symbolizing certain things. It's not that people are not interested in governance. I think more and more people want good governance. But often the way civil society functions 
you want to know what is it in for me as a particular social group. So you have different social groups demanding a better deal for themselves, thinking that as ordinary <coughs> citizens, they won't get a fair deal and they can't navigate it on their own as an individual. So I think that's where all this symbolism comes in and that's where this caste identities matter. I think so. We can continue. We can continue. I think the yeah, can Okay. <laughs> yeah, because the AC is on up and you have to do the stuff. Yeah. So it's been a very long day. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think we have a round of applause for all these people. <laughs> also, a uh, round of applause for Jordan Yusuf. Yeah, Jordan didn't mention yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you.